It was a few years ago in a Midwest city, and from what I know, the story is that the thief never got caught. And in fact, what I read was he was never pursued, so no one really knows his name, but this crime was remembered for a very long time. Let me tell you about what this young man did at a local convenience store in his community. He devised a plan, and what he would do is he would walk into a convenience store, much, something much like a 7-Eleven or a Circle K, whatever that would be, and, and he would hand the, the cash register, the, the person that was there, um, $20. This was the plan he devised. And when they opened up the cash register, um, as he gave the $20, he would take the money out of the open cash register, was the plan. So hand the 20 when they'd hit the, and buy something cheap like gum, and when they'd open it up, it was just 20, and then take the money all out of the crash register as it was there. So the plan seemed to work, um, gave the 20 for a pack of gum, and, but there was one small problem. He grabbed the money out, and it was told that there was only $14 in the register at that time. So when the crime was done, it was a net loss of $6 for this criminal. He lost $6 on the, he was $6 short. Really, that's sin defined by a botched robbery. You go through all this work and in the end, you've spent your life, you've spent your money, you've spent your time and your energy, and when life is over, you're left short, empty, and still guilty is really what sin does. The truth is that sin never gives what it promises. It always returns less than the sinner invests, and sin will always leave you $6 short. One of the great Puritan writers, Thomas Brooks, said it like this. He said, Satan promises the best, but pays the worst. He promises honor and pays with disgrace. He promises pleasure, but pays with, with pain. He promises profit, but pays with loss, and he promises life, but he pays with death. And this word sin, to try to speak about this in this time and culture today is not an easy thing because nobody is at fault today. So it's hard for us to hear these words out of Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Those are hard words. It appeared in a local newspaper not long ago. I don't know where the editor got the, the, the courage, but he put this in an editorial, and it said this, Dear everybody, we have a serious problem. All of us think we're good, but Jesus says we're not. Sincerely, the editor. <laughs> in reality, according to Romans 3.23, everybody is at fault. And always keep this in mind. When you blame others, you give up your power to change. When you blame others, you give up the power to change. See, there is a world of difference between saying I've made a mistake and I've sinned. Those are two important things. To say I've made a mistake removes ownership. To say I've made a mistake removes the, 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 really the, the commission of a rebellious act and makes it a mishap, an accidental. See, let me say it to you this way. When people see themselves as victims, here it comes now, listen church, then they're not part of a fall, they're just involved in an accident. When people see themselves as victims, you're not part of the Genesis 3 fall, but you're involved with, with simply as in an accident from, from culture. I didn't have the right culture at home or an education or the community I live in or our society or even our government. And if you don't know, this, this is important, if you don't know the seriousness of a disease, then you can't appreciate the cure. And that's why this is important. See, if sin doesn't exist, then there's no need for Jesus. Let me say that again. What you need, if you remove sin from, from as the foundational problem that we're faced with. For all have sinned, there's no need for a savior. And that's why the removal of this word, the removal of God, those two words go together because then the only answer 
The only answer is we need education. None of these things are inherently wrong. It's just when you think they can fix. See, sin is not an act. Sin is a condition. And that condition can only be fixed by someone outside of our sinful system. Folks, listen, that's why this is so important. Sin is the disease and the cross is the cure. And that's why we have to understand. So let me just start from a foundational part here. What is sin for just a moment? Let me give you two simple definitions and I'll build from them and we'll get more specific with the word. But if I can give it to you as simply as I can. Sin is the failure to do what's right. It's as simple as definition. What God and the Bible basically establishes what is right. One of the great definitions of sin I've, I've read comes from, from one of the early church fathers, Ignatius, who defined sin as this. Listen to this. He said, sin is refusing to believe God wants my best, my happiness, and my fulfillment, so I decide what's best for me. I'm the one who then begins to choose it. And the Apostle Paul, in the next few moments, I'm going to show you through Romans, that to live this way, to live in sin, you're going to see that the cash register is always empty. It's always six dollars short to live this kind of life, to say there is no God, there is no, there is no sin, and therefore I'll go ahead and choose what will make me happy and what will fulfill me. When, when I say you always come up six dollars short, the loss is so much more. It's catastrophic loss. And in fact, Paul is going to show you throughout the beginning chapters of Romans the ugly power of sin and why it can't be trifled with and why this word is so important. If there was, it, 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 it's why there is no such thing as a small sin. Listen to me carefully. Small sins become great sins when they're regarded as small sins. And this is what's important. We call it for what it is or what the Bible says it is. We don't sanitize it. Some people want to call it an affair and the Bible calls it adultery. Some want to call it a woman's choice. The Bible calls it murder of an unborn child. The Bible, the people will call it, it's just a white lie. And the Bible will say, no, 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 it is a lie. The, the society will say it's sticking it to the man. And, and, and the Bible said, no, it's called stealing. And that's why we can't trifle with small sins. You can't change the label on these things. While man calls it an accident, God will call it an abomination. Man will call it a blunder and God will call it blindness. Man calls it a defect, God calls it a disease. Man calls it a chance, God calls it a choice. Man calls it a fascination, God calls it a fatality. Man calls it an infirmity, God calls it an iniquity. Man calls it liberty, God calls it lawlessness. Man calls it a mistake, God calls it madness. Madness. Man calls it weakness. God calls it willfulness. Let's not sanitize it. Let's go back to the Bible of what the Word of God tells us that what sin is all about. You can turn it any way you want. It still ends up a sin. My mom is now 101 years old and before we had to put her, she was um, my parents, my father and my mom, my dad who is in heaven and Pastor Gary and Kelly's uh, parents, the, the, the Wilkerson's, th there was such a great relationship. And so my mom is the last of the foursome that will soon to be um, with them. But before we had to put her in assisted living, um, my mom uh, was living with my sister. And so someone gave my sister, who has three, three dogs, just as a gift, these expensive doggy biscuits from some bakery. And so my sister just put it in this, this expensive, and it's dog biscuits and with a bow on it and a box. It looked like a New York bakery. It was wrapped with the red and white twine. It was put on the, the counter because my sister had to run out. And she comes back and there's my mom with a cup of coffee <laughs> eating eating the dog biscuits at the table. And she told my sister, she said, hey, I don't know what bakery you got these in, but these are terrible. She said, I, she said I had to dip them in coffee just to be able to bite into them. 
But she said, no matter what I did, they were still bad. And all I kept thinking about is my mom sitting there dipping dog biscuits in, in, in coffee. Here's, here's what I started to realize, folks. Listen, and it doesn't matter if it's sin, you can dip it in anything you want to dip it in, it's not going to come out changed. You can dip it in political correctness. You can dip it in a woke society. You can dip it in your university. Every single time it comes out, it will be sin and it will be dangerous, but God can set you free today in this place. See, when sin doesn't exist, then every inner desire is right and legitimate. L listen, this is such an important, don't miss this part. Mark 7, 21 says, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, the fornications, the thefts, the murders, the adulteries, deeds of coveting, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. He said all of these things proceed from within. So when we don't call things sin, then whatever's in our heart becomes legitimate and acceptable. And because of sin's power to consume, there's no such thing as small sins. Sin is septic, it's catastrophic, it's toxic. It's, in, it's, it's everyone, it's a, it's, a, it's a global pandemic where everyone has been infected. There is, if, if, if Paul, the Apostle Paul, tweeted the verses we're about to give to you today, he would be banned from social media. But Paul doesn't make any apologies. He tells us that sin was an epidemic in the book of Genesis with the beginning of the human race, and then it became a pandemic as the population grew and covered the globe. And Paul starts immediately with one of the biggest myths of our times and annihilates it in verse 18. Listen to what he says in Romans 7, 18. If Paul would have tweeted this, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. Folks, this, this is so important because it takes man a long time to reach this conclusion. And it's from this myth of the goodness of man that we derive the faulty question, why do bad things happen to good people? That's where the question comes. Because when you keep out sin and Romans seven eighteen, when you keep out the heart that needs to be forgiven and changed and, and, and fixed by Christ, when you keep that out, then we don't, we, we don't believe in what Paul said, that no, no good dwells within me. And then all of a sudden, then we have this myth that some of you have asked this question, some of you have asked around the world. You've asked it in Spain and you've asked it in the UK. Those that are watching from the Netherlands, you'll ask the question. And the question is this, why do bad things happen to good people? Okay, let me give you the simplest answer for this. Here it comes. Only once did a bad thing happen to a good person. They crucified him. That's it. <laughs> that's, the only, that's the best answer I can give you. Only once did a bad thing happen to a good person. They crucified him, but that crucifixion set us free from the power of sin that seems to come against us. So as we get ready just to take a deep dive here, let me just tell you an amazing story I heard of a Brooklyn church back in the mid 1800s. Henry Ward Beecher was once asked by a young preacher in New York City, he said, how can he keep his congregation from falling asleep during his sermons? So Henry Ward Beecher said this, he said, I have a group of men that watch for the sleepers in the church. He says, and I gave them this instruction. If you see anybody nodding, sleeping, or dozing, here it comes. He said, rush to the pulpit and wake me up. <laughs> because if I'm preaching the gospel, nobody will be sleeping and know that this gospel is alive and God is doing something. Did you get that? Wake up the preachers 
If the congregation is sleeping, it's not you, it's here. It may be a little you. I pray that you'd hear it in my voice. I pray that you'd hear it in the Apostle Paul's words because you can't understand the magnitude of forgiveness unless we understand the foulness and the strength of sin. And there's nobody here that is watching around the world and around the United States that is rich enough, strong enough, or good enough to control sin. It is, it is devilish, it's foul, it'll come. I remember Nikki Cruz telling me the story of the early days at Brooklyn Teen Challenge. Think of the strength of sin. Nikki Cruz will be with us for fire in our bones. And, and, and as Nikki, I remember the story, he said in the beginning years, there was a young man that came in when, and was so addicted to heroin. And he said he wanted to be delivered so badly, he asked the directors to handcuff him to a radiator because he was so sure that if, he, that if he had the freedom, he'd go and buy heroin on the streets. And back in the 50s and early, in the late 50s, they, they, they acquiesced and, and handcuffed him because he asked, he said, I don't want to leave, I want to be set free in the handcuff. And folks, Nikki said the next morning, the radiator was gone. <laughs> That's the strength of sin. For us New Yorkers that know how heavy a radiator is, there was some man walking down the streets of Brooklyn with a radiator. That's the strength of sin, folks. Because this is what happened. Keep this, an old Puritan, I can't remember who said it. Don't miss this, get this, get this. Sin is so strong, it made the devil the devil. Sin, Satan didn't create sin. Sin made the devil the devil. That's why this is so, you know, I, I, I wasn't even going to say this, but I, I, I want to say it uh, because I don't care. So let me just say this. Keep, keep, keep this in mind. Sin, the longer you're in sin, here it comes, the longer you're in sin, sin doesn't, you don't get smarter, you get dumber. The lo- I'm sorry for the words, but I, you need to hear this. Do you ever notice it? That, that the longer you sin, you don't get wiser to what you're doing. For lack of better words, you get dumber. You don't, because you start getting in, you, it, a good darkness seems to come on us. And we would suppose that, that every, over time a, a man sins when he would little, know a little bit more about sin, it's, it's, it's foulness, it's death, that, but he doesn't. That's why, let me just say this, get this down. You won't see this on the screen. This is the, get get this. Sin doesn't age people well. There are no good, kind, happy, old sinners. Because sinners, sin doesn't age well. It, it begins to corrode and corrupt, and that's why we have to go after this. That's why I can't remember who said this, but they said, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to say, and cost you more than you want to pay. So the Apostle Paul says, to avoid this, the Apostle Paul says, let me tell you, get ready now, you did, you're going to have to write take pictures, whatever you need to do, take screenshots. If you're watching from home, just pause it on the laptop, whatever you need to do. Let me just show you very quickly, it's gonna come rapid fire, the description that Paul gives of this deadly pandemic called sin that's, that's covering the planet. Here's Roman's description. He says, first of all, here it comes, sin is a resident. It's living in me. Look at it. Romans 7, 17, as it is, it is no longer I myself do it, but it is sin, where is it? Living in me, my life, my life is a house, and sin comes in to run this house. Sin is a dweller, it's a resident, and sin lives in me. But Paul goes, not only that, sin is my prison warden. Listen to this. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a what? Prisoner of the law at work within me. He says, sin is the warden. I'm, I, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in chains. I'm in shackles. He also calls it, and folks, this is the one that began to 
really sober me up. Sin is a retailer. I was sold into sin. Listen to this. Romans 7, 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Here it comes. Sold as a slave to sin. What does that mean? Here it comes. That, that according to sin and the enemy, you're just a piece of merchandise. Sin sold me out. Sin sold me to lust. Sin sold me to anger. Sin sells us into insanity, sells us into depression, sells us into bondage. When I am in sin, I am just a piece of merchandise. But that's not enough. Paul goes, let me get deeper in some, one of the Romans 6 right before. He goes, sin is a tyrant. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil lust. That word reign means to act like a dictator. Sin is not only my master, it's a tyrant. It's a dictator. It's my Kim Jong-un of the soul that wants to come and, 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 and affect its own personal will over my life. I can't even control. Paul says this. And finally, sin is a crushing weight that we are under. Romans 3, 9, Jew and Gentile alike are under. Here's the word, the power of sin. We are under its crushing domination as though some boulder were, was on top of us and we can't breathe and move and act as we want to because you're being crushed by this weight of sin. And finally, sin is a spreading disease. Romans 5.20, we forget the first part of this verse and know the second part where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That word abound means to spread. It's the word that's used for a horrible disease that, is, that has been passed on to us and we have been infected by. Folks, this is, this is what he says. He says, sin are all of these things that seem to come at us and want to control us. And that's why when you speak on sin as a pastor, if you're watching as a leader, it is our job to speak against this that, that, that because it's so dominating against the people. That's why the great American evangelist Billy Sunday said it best when he talked about sin. He said, listen, I'm against sin. I'll kick it as long as I have a foot. I'll fight it as long as I have a fist. I'll butt it as long as I have a head. I'll bite it as long as I've got a tooth. But when I'm old, fistless, footless, and toothless, I'll gum it until I go home to glory. Listen to it again. Sin is a tenant that will not leave. Sin is a disease that seems to infect everyone. Sin is a tyrant that won't let me go. Sin is a prison warden that has chained me up. Sin is a merchant that has sold us as, as merchandise. And sin is a crushing weight. Look at those words. Let them sink in. It won't leave no matter how many times I've evicted it. Here it comes. It's sinned. It sells me out. It weighs me down. It holds me captive. It infects me and others. It's an ugly dictator and abuses me. This is what Paul says. Paul, this is what Paul describes. He was a scientist, a sculptor and an engineer. He was a painter and a philosopher. He was even a musician. And a man historians say will never again see another one endowed with so many God-given gifts and skills. But one of his greatest gifts, one of his greatest works that he produced was a painting called The Last Supper. His name was Leonardo da Vinci. The painting of The Last Supper is a, is a masterpiece. And people forget that, the, that the, the setting of The Last Supper was, was the shocking moment that they hear someone will betray me. And one of the things that da Vinci did was the expressions that you see on the 12 disciples was the paint, he painted literally people's faces. They, they weren't just abstract. He brought in models and painted their faces. And in 1495, when he was painting the face of Christ, he sought long and hard for the right face. And he said in one of the churches in Italy, he found a boy named Pietro Bandinelli. He said his face was like that of an angel. And he, he looked at this young boy and said, that's, that's Christ. That's the face I'm going to use for Christ. He said he saw something. He saw purity. He saw something in Pietro. And the story says that the last face that he was missing was Judas Iscariot, the one that would betray him. 
And the story goes on to say that it took three years as he started the, the mission 1495 to paint this. Everything was done except it's Judas. 1495, all the disciples were painted except one, Judas Iscariot. He needed one that, would, that he would see the betrayal. He would see the betrayer. He would see someone where sin is corroding. That he would sell out the Christ. And he said after three years and after a long and hard search, he found a man in the slums. And Leonardo stated his face made him shudder. And he brought the man in, was going to give him money. He didn't know what the man would do with money. And he asked the man his name, and the man goes, I'm Pietro. I'm the man you painted three years ago to be Christ. I'm Pietro Bandinelli. Think for just a moment, folks. Pietro was under the power of sin for three years. Three years earlier, you're painted as Christ. Left under sin, you're painted as Judas. Don't miss this. Because what sin does, sin will fascinate you, and then it will assassinate you. That's what it does. It begins to fascinate you in, and in three years, Christ now becomes Judas in this moment. Sin is not some sweet, sentimental word. It's a radical, violent explosion in the soul. And I'm powerless to fix myself. I need something. I need someone to fix me. Now, folks, I want to read to you Romans 7 as we are coming close to a conclusion. I want you to listen. I want to read to you Romans chapter 7. I reread it this morning, and I'm not saying this for any other reason. I was so moved by this passage. Tears welled up in my eyes I began to, as I began just to go deeper and deeper into what sin does, what sin is, and to think of Pietro of just three years of what sin does inside of his life. I started to read Romans 7 again this morning, and, and as I'm whispering the words, my heart was filled with emotion as I kept thinking of a man that felt the tyranny, felt the bondage, the prison warden, felt the, the squatter, the resident that would not leave, felt the disease that was spreading to every part of his body, the sin that was coming. I want to read it to you out of the message translation. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. You didn't, if you haven't brought your Bible, if you're watching online, just lis listen to these words. He says, but I need something more, the Apostle Paul says. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in action. Sometimes has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. Verse 21, it happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. Listen to this. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. And is there, look, listen to the question. Is there no one who can do anything for me? And then Paul says, isn't that the real question? And hallelujah for verse 25. The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ came and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with my whole heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. The Apostle Paul says there is an answer. And what he was saying was when Jesus comes, here it is, folks, he breaks the power of the dictator. He bankrupts the merchant. He blows open the locked doors on the prison wall. Warden. He gives me a clean bill of health for my disease. He unties this weight that was connected for me and sets me free today. God sets me free. God sets me free. God sets me free. Sets me free. Hallelujah. Folks, that's why 
to be forgiven is not that I just go to heaven. You know what forgiveness is? Forgiveness is a revolution. Forgiveness is an overthrow of a dictator. Forgiveness is a coup against sin. Something, do you understand? He breaks the power of the tyrant. He looks at the squatter inside of me and says, you're out, I'm in. I had a, I had a friend, I had a friend that used to say this. Let me speak to the ladies for a second. He said, you ever have an old boyfriend that you try to get rid of and he won't leave? He says, what do you do when you have it? You go like, we are broken up, broken up. Stop. Some of you may be sitting here and you're going, yeah, he's on the other side. What do you do? Here it is. Ladies, listen. What do you do when you have an old boyfriend that won't leave? Here it comes. Here it is. This is, this is profound. Get a bigger boyfriend. Because when he shows up, the old boyfriend can't hang around. I'm telling you, when Jesus shows up inside of our heart, he comes into our heart and our life. He speaks to sin and says, there's not room for both of us. You got to go, tyrant. You got to go, dictator. You got to go, disease. You're moving out. Someone's moving out. And Jesus goes, and it's not me. Guess who's leaving this heart? Guess who's leaving this place? It's Jesus that comes in. Hallelujah. If you're here and you're not a Christian, Jesus wants to move in. And it's time for sin to move out. And if you are a Christian and you are still under the crushing weight and the tyrant of sin, it's time for them to be evicted. Listen to me, young lady. Your wrist could be cut up and he's here to come not only forgive you but to set you free. You are valuable to him. You are valuable to him. Sin ravages people. It changes you deep and then moves its own, its, its, its own way just to come and, and deepen the pain and the crushing. Jesus has come to crush sin. And it's like C.S. Lewis said about the society, even about religion. He says, we have this strange illusion that time cancels sin. But mere time does nothing to the fact or the guilt of sin. You know, you know what crushes sin? Here it is. 1 John 3, 8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. That's why he came. I want you to stand with me as we get ready to close. There's a number of notes on the screen that I'm going to bypass most of them because I have to tell you something I just read this morning. You're at the top of your career. You're considered, money is never an issue. You're considered to be on the A list of acting and everything else. And I just read this article just this morning. Wasn't, wasn't intending to read it, but just read it this morning. He was considered to be so, such an A-list and, and the pinnacle of his career that he was knighted by the queen. Sir Anthony Hopkins, considered one of the greatest actors in all of Hollywood from England. He said, but from the 1970s, he could not get free from an addiction of alcohol that was ruining his life. And he said, just recently, he sat in an AA meeting. This man whose money is, ne money is not an issue. Feet and hands on Hollywood Boulevard. To have an Anthony Hopkins, Sir Anthony Hopkins in your movie means it's, it's, it has to have some type of weight or some type of viewership. And he's sitting in an AA meeting talking about it's that moment where you have to be brutally honest. And just simply said, after 30 and 40 years, I can't get set free. And he said, a question changed his life. One question. He said, some lady who is nameless, no name, 
looked at this man and said, why don't you try God? That's what she said. And Anthony Hopkins said, at that moment, I went from atheist to believer. He said, I've been an atheist for 40 years, and he said, atheism has got me nowhere. He said, and his words, he said, the desire for out was broken immediately. You can read, you can read the story. I just read it this morning. He said, in a moment, it was as if you brought in the tyrant killer, the disease healer, the squatter remover, the weight crusher, and said, everybody out, this is my home now. This is my home. So Romans 7 ends with that amazing question. Is there any hope? Is there any? And he just gives us a brief moment. Let me read to you what Romans 8 says. Because until you stop at Romans 7 and go, I'm a sinner. I need, if, if it's not sin, then you don't need Jesus. Let me just say that again. Whatever you call, if, if you don't call it sin, then you don't need a savior. The disease, the disease is sin. The cure is Christ and his cross. But if we don't admit it to be sin, so it starts, it starts with that. Let me read you the rest of the story because if we can't settle on that issue of sin, you can't step into Romans 8. You're trespassing. You're trying to great, great you can't grab Roman 8 promises without Roman 7 confession. You can't look at Roman and go like, oh, all things work together for good. That them they'll love that. No, no, you, that's not yours. Until you go, wait, I'm I'm jacked up, Roman 7. Then I can step into Romans 8, but I got a Jesus that can set me free. I've got a Christ that can that can do this. So here it is. Here it is. This is what we close with. Here it comes. Romans 8, verse 1. Let's stay with the message. With the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, the faithful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under the continuous low-lying back cloud. Oh, I love this part. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. And here it is. I love this next verse. Here it comes. And God went for the juggler when he sent his come on I got it did you miss that did anybody did anybody get that part okay you got it everybody else is like wake up the preacher wake up the preacher if they don't get it look at it God went for the juggler when he sent his own son I'm gonna give you one more chance here it is you, let me tell you why you should be happy it's 11 45 I'm ending early and if you don't get excited, I got 15 more minutes of stuff that I'll do. I'll do. That's that sin nature inside of me. That's the revenge spirit inside of me. Here it comes. God went for the juggler when he sent his own. There we go. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son Jesus, he personally took on the human condition. Enter the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He entered into my disordered mess. Mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. When Adam sinned, he fled from God. But when a sinner believes, he comes back to him. That's what happens. He comes back to him. That's it, that's, that's, that's where it starts. So today, if you're here today, and you can, you can go, man, I am struggling humanity. 
I've got a disordered man. I, I reckon on the outside, I make the money. I got the scholarship. I'm at Fordham. I'm at NYU. I'm here today. I'm in the Yankee front office. I'm on Broadway. I'm at, I've, I'm on the A-list. Just, just like Anthony Hopp, you can go and you can't deal with the tyrant, the weight, the disease, the resident on your, you're not strong enough, rich enough, smart enough. You need help. His name is Jesus. That's what it is. Every head up, nobody, nobody bow your head. Every eye open. This is business. Because some of you are so tired of living six dollars short. You're so tired of that. Everything you do, you're left empty. You feel still guilty and you're going, where's, where's the help? That was the cry of Romans 7. But Jesus has come to set you free today. I want to invite you to a relationship with him. He, is, he goes for the juggler and says, let me come in and change you. Let me change you from the inside out. And that new relationship is simply called being born again. That's just what it is. It's being born again. What does that mean, Pastor Tim? You get a brand new chance. But here, here's what it is. You get a, not only a second chance, you get the only chance that you need to live in victory with Christ inside of you. With Christ inside of you, victory is, is imminent. God comes in and changes you. Some of you are so tired of living six dollars short. You're going, I, I, I need him in my life. I need this stuff. It's, it's taken over. My life is six dollars short. But today, today, I want Christ in my life. I want my life changed. With everybody. Listen, folks, there's too much at stake to worry about your car right now. There's too much at stake to go, I got to get this validated so I don't pay the full price for my car. There's too much at stake here. There's eternity at stake the rest of your life. Some of you are older and you're realizing the, what, what sin has done. And now today you're starting to go, I need help. I need Jesus. Not, not Times Square Church, not religion. I need Jesus. Christianity is not coming to a place. It's coming to a person. And if you're in the balcony, the annex, the main floor, watching online, I want you to listen to me. You're saying, Pastor Tim, the $6 short, I'm done with that. I want Christ in me. I want my life changed. I need him in me. Without any hesitation, that you hold up your hand right now. Hold it up as high as you can. Say, I need him in me. 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 Keep him up. Keep him up. Keep him up. Okay. Keep him up. So let me tell you what I'm going to do. Listen. I want you with the show of your hands. Don't just stand there. Come out of your seat and meet me down here. I want you to quickly get out of your seat as fast as you can. Balcony, I'll wait for you. Come on. Balcony, get out of your seat. Walk down here. Tonight, today is going to be a new day. He's going to set you free today. Come on. Get out of your seat right now. Don't wait there. God's going to set you free today. Balcony, come on. Main floor, come on. Online, just wait. We're going to begin to pray with you online. We haven't forgotten you in Nigeria and Rwanda. We haven't forgotten you, but quickly, get out of your seat. You're going, I need God to set me free today. I need freedom today. Quickly, just get out of here. And if you need to grab your friend and just go, come on, let's go. I'm, I'm going to go with you today. You get out of your seat. We're waiting for you, balcony. Make your way down here. We're not going to move on. We're going to wait because I know it takes a little bit for that balcony to come down. To come down. Can, can we go to that, Mark? Can we just give, give me that third verse again? My sin, oh, the bliss. My, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glory. This my sin not in part, my sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross. Come on, sing a church. Is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Come on. My sin, oh, the bliss. Come on, sing it again. My sin. Sing it, everybody. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Nailed to the cross. Come on, sing it, Times Square. Sing it online.
those that are up here, look at me just for a second. This is going to be a day of freedom for you. This is going to be the way. I saw you when I was walking in tonight. I saw you just as I was walking in. I'm so happy to see you here. This is going to be a day of freedom too, right here. That crushing weight, that tyrant, the prison warden, the disease that seems to want to come and control us. Today, God breaks it. We start with being born again. Christ comes in as the, okay, follow me. Not only as the resident, he comes in as the president. He comes in and says, I'm in charge. Everybody out. Now listen, when he comes in, he's going to start changing the furniture. You may get a few people get kicked out of your life. But he's the president now. So he's the one that controls everything. The Bible says that no man could see the kingdom of heaven unless they're born again. And today, that's what we're at. We're saying, God, come in. We always say, it's as simple as what? A, B, C. The very first one is this. Admit what? That I'm a sinner. That's Romans 7. B, believe that God sent his son to break the sin. That's Romans 7 and 8. And then C, confess him as Lord. That's Romans 10. That's saying you're, you're now in charge now. I confess you as the president, as the Lord of my life. I want all of us to pray this together. Come on, let's everybody here say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, say it with me loud. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. The Bible is my guide. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen.